Um, you went to the hospital, right? Yes. What hospital did you go to? Jupiter Medical Center. And um, tell me what happened at Jupiter Medical Center. Um, I got to Jupiter Medical Center and they treated me for shock. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was there, I started to hyperventilate and I had a seizure. And uh, to stop the seizure, um, they put an IV and gave me Ativan. Okay. And do you know why you had the seizure? I believe I had the seizure because of the panic attack. Okay. Um, they put an IV in and you said they gave you Ativan. What, what did Ativan do to you physically? Uh, in the middle of the seizure, after they put the Ativan in the IV, my entire body relaxed. Okay. My muscles became untense. Did you begin to feel your brain differently? Were you, were you able to speak? I was able to speak, but I could tell that um, the medicine they had given me had affected my conscious thoughts. Okay. Did there come a time when a, a detective came to the, to the hospital? Yes. Was it before or after the Ativan in your IV? It was after. So when the detective came to the hospital, did she begin to question you? Yes. And have you had an opportunity to listen to that taped statement? Yes. Um, describe to us your, uh, any impairment in your abilities to speak or to remember during that time period due to the Ativan. I had a severe loss of my motor skills and my speech was severely impaired. Could you hear that on the, on the tape? Yes, I could easily tell by the sound of my voice that I was not in the right state of mind. Were you stuttering at times? Yes. Do you normally have a stutter? No. Did you tell the detective that you were having these, these problems due to the Ativan? Yes. But did you try your best to tell her what happened that evening? Yes. One thing that you talked about that evening, and I want to see if you recall it, can you remember seeing any parts of the face or the arms of any of the gunmen? I believed one of the gunmen to have gold teeth. Okay, and, and how is that? How did you see that? Um, the flashes from the muzzles of the guns lit up a good portion of the front of the figures. Do you know the race of that person that had the gold teeth? I believe them to be black. Okay. Now, um, you know, you've known Chris Vasada, correct? Yes. Did you, were you able to tell if any of those gunmen were Chris Vasada? No. That gunman that you believe had, that you saw gold teeth in his mouth, did he have dreads as well? It looked like there were dreads sticking out from the bottom of his mask. And what are dreads? Uh, matted hair. Okay, like braids? Um, not quite braids, but they're long hair and it's stuck together. It looks like dreadlocks, like somebody who doesn't, um, they're not combing their hair out? Yes. Now, um, let me take you back to the hospital. You're speaking to a detective that evening, correct? Yes. While you're speaking with that detective, even though you've had the Ativan, are you still realizing, you know, I have all those guns and drugs in my house? Yes, I knew I was gonna be in trouble. All right. Despite that, did you refuse to talk to the detective? No. Did you tell the detective you weren't gonna talk until you had an attorney? No. You cooperated with her that evening? Yes. How long did you stay in the hospital? Uh, a few hours, I believe. I don't know exactly how long. Did they release you eventually? Yes. And where did you go? I went to my brother's house. The following days after that, did the police come to talk to you? Yes. Did they tell you come down to the station? You were free, though. You weren't under arrest, were you? That's correct. Do you remember what day it was you went down to the police station? I believe it was February 8th. Okay. So now you know you're like almost two, two days away, two days since the shooting. 
during that two days, are you thinking, man, I'm going to be in trouble for all those guns and drugs in the house? Yes. Despite that, did you still voluntarily go down to the police station? Yes. When you got there to the police station, did they put you in an interview room and two female detectives questioned you? Yes. Did they read you your Miranda warnings? Yes, they did. Mr. Vorpagel, your intelligence level, um, how would you describe it? You know how to read and write, correct? Yes. Did you understand your Miranda warnings? Yes, I did. Did you, did you realize you didn't have to say anything? You could have had a police officer or a, a lawyer there for you. Yes. Despite all of that, did you waive your Miranda warnings and say, I don't want an attorney? And did you continue to talk to those detectives? Yes, I did. For how long? I believe the first interview was four or five hours. Okay. Did there come another time when you were interviewed? Yes. Did you speak with them freely, the same questions I asked you? Yes, I did. Did you admit everything to those officers about you being the owner of those guns and you being the owner of those drugs? Yes. Did you try to blame anybody else for all of that? No. Did you tell them everything you remembered about the shooting? Yes. And everything you knew about it? Yes. Did there come a time, actually, let me rephrase that. Um, at any time that evening, had Chris Vasada come over to your house and sat down at that fire pit with you, Brandy, Sean, and Kelly? No. So you're speaking with the officers. Did there come a time when they did, in fact, arrest you? Yes. Uh, February 9th, the FBI came to the hotel that the police had put me at and arrested me. Right. The police had paid for a hotel to, to keep you safe, is that correct? Yeah, my house was still a crime scene and I wasn't allowed to go home. All right. Were you expecting that you were getting arrested soon? I did. All right. And so when you say the FBI arrested you, was it for federal charges? Yes. The gun charges and the, mer and the drug charges inside your house? Yes. Trafficking while armed? Yes. And you got arrested that evening. Have you ever been out since then? No. After you were arrested and charged federally, uh, did you obtain an attorney? Yes. And who is that? My first attorney was uh, Christy Militello. Was she a federal public defender? Yes. Did you speak with her and did she help you out in that case? Yes. Did you yourself make the decision to plead guilty to the, to the drugs and the guns? Yes. And who sentenced you? Was it a plea bargain or did you plea up to the court, to the judge? I plead up to the court. Okay, when we say plea up to the court, you pled guilty. Did you have a plea bargain before you pled guilty? Uh, yes. What was that? My sentencing guidelines were between 97 and 106 months. All right. 97 and 106 months? Yes. So you pled knowing that you would be sentenced somewhere around there? Yes. And who sentenced you? The federal judge? Yes. Um, had you made a decision, and if so, when, had you made the decision that despite your federal charges and despite all of that, had you made a decision you were gonna cooperate with us, the state government, in these homicide cases? Yes. When did you make that decision? From the very beginning. Right after the shooting when you ran to the cop? Yes. Um, did you eventually then um, you got sentenced by the federal court, right? Yes. And how long did she sent the federal judge sentence you to? Eight years. Um, did you sit down either before that or after that? Did you sit down with the federal prosecutor, Ms. Osborne, I believe, and tell her everything you knew about the shootings? Yes. Had you already done that, though, with the detectives, the state detectives? Yes. All right. In testifying and in cooperating throughout this, and in testifying in this case and potentially another case uh, against Mr. Stewart, 
Um, are you hoping that your cooperation will convince the federal judge to give you a lighter sentence? Yes. Is there a guarantee that that's going to happen? No. Even if it weren't going to happen, would you be cooperating with us? Yes. And you've been in federal prison since then? Yes. Uh, may I have a moment, Your Honor? Did there come a time, let me take you back to the hospital, when that first detective came to speak with you and you were on the Ativan, do you remember her telling you that um, Chris Vasada had said he was at your house sitting by the fire pit? Yes. Okay. Was Chris Vasada sitting at the fire pit that evening? No, he was not. Did you tell the detective that? Yes. Okay. I don't have anything further at this time. Cross-examination. Now, Mr. Vorpagel, you told the jury that in 2017, you had been engaged in drug dealing for five or six years? Yes. And in fact, you hadn't had a job, a legitimate job, in at least two years before that? Yes. And you were able to you know, rent a place to live and have a car, go out to eat, hang out with friends, do whatever you wanted to based on the earnings that you had from drug dealing. Yes. Okay. And you told the state that you had actually been using drugs since you were in high school. Yes. Okay, a wide variety of drugs. In high school, it was mostly just marijuana. But since then, you had started using mushrooms, ecstasy, cocaine, alcohol. Yes. Okay. And your family had at times tried to intervene. That's correct. Okay. And at least on one occasion, your sister had taken you to talk to somebody about your use of drugs. Yes. Okay. And the reason that you wanted to talk to somebody or that you wanted to try to get some help was because the consistent use of drugs every day was causing you to have anger issues? Yes. Okay. You've never gotten treatment for that? No. And in fact, since you've been in prison, you haven't sought out any treatment for your addiction? No. Okay. So you had moved into Mohawk Street in October of 2016. Yes. But in November of 2016, you had left to go to Michigan. Yes. And that was to resolve a court case. Yes. And while you were there, you were actually kept on house arrest with a scram bra bracelet and alcohol and drug monitoring. Yes. Okay, and that was for a period of about six weeks? Yes. Okay, and you had returned to Mohawk Street in January 14th of 2017? Yes. Okay, so you had been home about three weeks? Yes. All right, you talked about this individual that you knew named Lou Kasukas. Yes. And you had known him for a number of years? Yes. And can you describe for the jury what Mr. Kasukas looked like? Um, he's, I believe he's half black and half Hispanic. Um, he's taller than me. He's very built. He works out a lot. Uh, he also has dreads and he has gold teeth. Okay. And you knew an individual named Christopher Vasada. You had known him for a number of years. Yes. And you considered Mr. Vasada to be a friend? Yes. You also knew that Mr. Vasada was friends and closely associated with Mr. Katsukas? Yes. Okay. 
Um, now, you told us in the beginning, when you were talking to the state, that you had had some conflicts with Mr. Kasukas. Not me personally, but a few friends of mine, uh, Luke had owed money to. Not you personally? Yes. So it didn't involve your money? No. Okay. And you understand the state talked to you just a moment ago about the Rule 35, which is the reduction in your federal sentence? Yes. You are aware that you must tell the truth in order to apply for that kind of yes. reduction? Okay. So not you personally, sir? Yes. Okay. You told the police on several occasions that you had some very close friends that you felt that Mr. Kasukas had taken advantage of and gotten money from. Objection and proclamation. Overruled. Yes. Okay. One of them was an individual named Massimo Bertazzoi or Bertazzai. Yes. Okay. And you described him as being a very good friend of yours. Yes. You actually told me in deposition that Mazamo had given you $10,000 when you went to Michigan. Yes, he had loaned me money for a lawyer. For the lawyer. Did you hire a lawyer, sir? Uh, the money he loaned me was for a lawyer in Florida for another DUI. Right, because you didn't hire a lawyer in Michigan, as you told me in deposition. I don't remember you asking me if I hired a lawyer in Michigan. I asked you if you, you told me you borrowed money. Okay, tie this up real fast. Sure. You remember giving a deposition, sir, on May the 20th? Yes. Okay, and that was at the state attorney's office? Yes. Okay. And do you have a copy of your deposition up there, sir? No, I do not. I'd ask you to undo his handcuffs there so he can turn the pages, please. What? And so, could you repeat the page for me again? It is on page 56. So, sir, if you turn to page 56 in specific line. Um, it starts at line 19 and moves over to page 57. So line 19 of page 56, sir, read that and keep reading through page 57. And when you're done reading, look up so we know you're finished. and I'll wait for a question. Okay, sir. Did you tell me in the deposition that Massimo had loaned you $10,000 a few months before this incident? Yes. Okay, and did you tell me that it was before you went to Michigan? Yes. And did you tell me that he loaned it to you so you could hire a lawyer for the DUI? Not for this DUI. I was referring to the DUI that I had already had in Florida. The DUI you already had in Florida, which you had already pled out to reckless. Yes, I pled out to reckless in 2018 while I was incarcerated. Okay. And so you, you're telling me now that when you said you bought, you hired a lawyer for the DUI, you were referring to the reckless charge in Florida. Yes. Okay. So you owed Mr. Massimo $10,000. You also owed an individual named Lawson about $2,000. Yes. Okay. And in addition to that, you had some other ongoing conflicts when you came back from Michigan with people that you sold to. I don't know what conflicts you're referring to. Well, one of your regular customers, sir, was an individual named Cole Slaugh, S-L-A-U-G-H, although you have him in your phone as Cole, S-L-A-W. 
You know who I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Slaw was an individual that you regularly shipped packages to. Yes. Okay. And Mr. Slaw, when you came back, had a number of conversations with you by text message and on the phone where he was extremely angry about the fact that you had taken money from him and not shipped the product. That is correct. Okay. There was also another individual um, a man that I believe you call something Michigan. It's the guy you were talking to when you were there in Michigan, right? You know who I'm talking about, sir? Could you tell me his name? Well, you have him in your phone. One second. As Teddy Michigan. Yes, I know who that is. Okay, and he is another individual that you shipped packages to? No. No? No, I've never sent a package to Teddy. Well, what was, why was he angry about the money that you owed him? I don't believe I owed him any money. You don't believe you owed him any money. Do you remember a conversation that you had upon returning to Florida in which you were talking to a young woman by the name of Tiffany's Renee? Yes. And indicated that you had received more than 100 text messages from him? From Teddy? Mm -hmm. I don't recall that. Don't recall it at all? I mean, Teddy is a friend of mine, and we texted very often. Mm -hmm. We still talk to this day. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember the specific incident that you're speaking of. OK. And I'll bring it to you one second, sir. You returned to Florida on January 14th of 2017, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Judge, it's like a thousand page document. Are you saying that you didn't do any drug deals with him at all, sir, or that you purchased from him or that you sent him something? What's your? I never mm -hmm. specifically sent Teddy packages. What does that mean, though? What is your relationship with him? Uh, he's a friend of mine that lives in Michigan. Uh huh. Okay. And so I'm going to show you the extraction from your phone. And this is actually starting at 192 of 774. So in January of 2017, January 15th, you're getting messages from Teddy asking you how much for 200. You're telling him it's 500. He's asking you in white, right? He says, right here. Down the side. This is the this is the, the content. <coughs> okay. Um, he's saying I don't have money for the white right now, which I presume is cocaine. Okay. And so, I mean, what is that conversation about, sir? Are you selling to him? Is he buying from you? Uh, he wanted to buy pills from Dan. Uh huh. Okay. And. When we go back up a little bit further, you're continuing to have conversations with him. This is on the 16th, January 16th of 2017, right? Yeah. Okay. 
and he's saying, don't make me use my plane ticket. Yeah, he had a plane ticket that he was trying to visit me in March. Uh -huh. Talk right into the microphone. Push, push, push it back. Yep. He had a plane ticket that he was going to use to visit me in March. Uh-huh. Just to visit you because he's your friend. Yes. Him and Cole were planning to come down to visit me in March. Cole had come the previous year in March to visit me. All right. And take a look at these messages down here, sir. Starting on January 16th. So that was for what, sir? So, you know, hold, pause for a second. You two are kind of having a conversation up here, and we got your mm -hmm. way back there. So both of you are just talking to each other mm -hmm. all close up. We got to get a little more formality here. Go ahead. The $600 was for what, sir? I don't remember. You don't remember? If he sent me $600, it was probably for cocaine or for Xanax. Which you would mail to him in Michigan? No, I never sent any packages to Teddy. I would have mailed it to Cole. Okay, and Cole would then give it to Teddy? Yes. All right. Um, and so when you told the police initially that you didn't have any issues and you didn't have any problems with people um, and you didn't owe any money to people, that wasn't true. I didn't have any problems with anyone. But you owed money to a lot of people. Yes. Okay. And some of it had to do with these individuals that you took money from in exchange for sending drugs and then didn't get the package to them? Yes. Okay. And so you would also buy things from other states and have it shipped to you? Yes. Much of the drugs that were in your house, the marijuana that was recovered, the edibles that were recovered, were things that came from out of state and were shipped to you? Yes. Three and a half pounds? Yes. Shipped to you, right? Yes. Okay. And when you went to Michigan, that was a very expensive proposition, right? Um, what do you mean by that? Cost you a lot of money. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, in fact, when you went to Michigan, do you remember telling people that you had spent $4,126.37 just for the fine? No. I'll show it to you, sir. That's at 246. Are you meaning page 246? Of this document, Judge. Do you mind if I just use my notes? It's okay, because it'll be faster. Was that page 246? I'm sorry, that is my father's number.
Yes, I remember that. Okay. So it cost you over four thousand dollars just for the wine, right? Um, that text message was uh, actually a lie to my father. Oh, just to get some money from him? Uh, to delay, or yes, actually to get to get him to cover my rent. Okay, and but you did have to pay a lot of money to the courts up there. I believe the fines were just over a thousand dollars. And you were on what they call a scram bracelet in house arrest. Uh, no, it was not a bracelet. It was a breathalyzer box. Okay, that was at your house. Yes. All right, and you had to pay for that. Yes. Okay, and so by the time you came back from Michigan a couple months later, you were pretty low on cash. Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, when you came back, do you remember texting people and asking them to bring you cigarettes and buy them for you because you were flat broke? I don't know if it was because I was flat broke, but I didn't have a car, so usually when someone was coming by my house, I would ask them to pick something up that I needed. Okay. And so when you came back, it became rather urgent that you get back into the game and start making some money. Yes. All right. And it was going to be with some difficulty because, as you've mentioned, you'd lost your driver's license. Yes. You didn't have a vehicle. Yes. Okay. And your father was expecting you to come back and to resume paying the rent and taking care of yourself. Yes. Right. And how much was the rent there? $2,000 a month. Mm-hmm. So when you came back, sir, um, in addition to going back to your regular customers, you reached out to an individual um, to start up a new business. Do you remember that? Uh, no, I do not. January 14th, you are back in town. And you start communicating with someone named Moss Cord. That's how you have him in your phone. Yes. Okay, his real name is actually Cord Eric Moss. Okay. All right, and he was an individual that you had known for some time, right? I, no, I had met him just before leaving for Michigan. Okay, and when you came back, you approached him about partnering up with you. Yes. Okay, to increase <coughs> sales to a lot of people. Yes. All right, and get back the money that you had lost. Yes. Okay, now we started off by talking about the fact that you said you didn't have any personal conflict with Luke Kasukas. No. Right? And that he wasn't involved in causing you any financial losses. He had never taken money from me. Do you know an individual by the name of Kyle Cote? Yes. Okay, and who is Kyle? He is a friend. How long have you known him? I've known Kyle about five years. Okay. Now, you started by telling the state attorney that you believe that Luke Kasukas had actually robbed a friend of yours. Yes. Okay. And that happened while you were still in Michigan. I thought it had happened about a, right when I got back from Michigan. Well, you came back on January 14th, correct? Yes. Okay, and do you remember exchanging text messages with both Kyle as well as Sean Henry about what had happened? I remember talking to Sean about it. I don't remember talking to Kyle about it. Okay, and I'm going to show him documents from starting at 
I remember that conversation. that you had shipped six pounds of marijuana to Florida to your partner? Yes. Okay. And that six pounds of marijuana is what was stolen from Joey Keating's house. I had told Kyle that I shipped six pounds so that Kyle would think that the situation was about me and I wouldn't have to tell him whose weed it really was. Okay, so you just told someone that you trafficked across state lines and six pounds of marijuana because you didn't want to reveal all the parties' names. Yes. Okay, now you've also told us that you and Sean had come to believe that the individual who broke into Joey Keating's house and took that marijuana was Luke Kasukas. Yes. In fact, you have repeatedly told police and other people that the person who came to the house and committed this robbery or burglary was somebody who was driving a white charger. Yes. And that was a white charger that Luke Kasukas drove. Yes. Okay, but that wasn't true. Luke Kasukas did drive a white charger. But it wasn't true that that was the vehicle that was seen. I believe it was. Okay. Do you want to see this again, sir? Do you remember this text message between you and Sean Henry where you talked about the silver truck? Yes, I remember that. Okay. And you actually had a screenshot of the silver truck yes. from that robbery. Yes. Okay. And you had some pretty extensive conversations with Mr. Henry about the silver truck have being a silver truck with black rims. Yes. Right? And when you spoke to Kyle Coat, when you asked him, asked him, have you ever seen this vehicle before, you were talking about the silver truck picture that you sent. Yes. Okay? And that's when you told him that somebody had broken into your partner's home and stolen the six pounds of marijuana that you had sent. Yes. Okay? So the whole story that you told the police about Mr. Kasukas robbing Joey Keating and creating this problem is based on a lie. No, it's not. He doesn't drive a silver truck, sir. Yes, but... Luke Kasukos was at Joey's house looking at weed before it was robbed. That's well, he's a drug thing. dealer, sir. Right? Yes. He does what you do. Yes. Which is import large quantities of marijuana and parcel it out in smaller packages to other drug dealers. Yes. Okay. So that is what all of your statements were based on. And then, frankly, you just changed the facts about the car to make it more compelling. No, I was shown a picture of that white car. Where is it, sir? I don't know. Okay, it's not the one that's in your phone. No. Right? Okay. So, 
Joey Keating had been robbed right before you came back of six pounds of marijuana, which I believe you told me once was worth about $14,000. Yes. Okay. And that's what sparked the real urgency, you say, to do something about Luke Kasukas. Yes. Okay. That just happened to occur at a time, sir, where you also were lacking in funds from your drug dealing. Yes. Okay. And wanted to expand your business by partnering, partnering up with another individual. Yes. Okay. So although you told the police that this didn't have anything to do with competition. It did not. Okay. So, sir, Luke Kasukas is not allowed to come to your house, correct? No. All right. In fact, you have told people that you would never allow Luke Kasukas to walk across the threshold into your house. That's correct. Okay. You have known that he was good friends with Mr. Fasada. Yes. There had been times that Mr. Fasada had actually come there and Luke would be in the car and you wouldn't allow Luke to come into the house. That's correct. Okay. So this had been a relatively long-standing conflict with Mr. Kasukas. Yes. Okay. Sean Harding, Sean Henry didn't live with you? No. In fact, as you've told us, no one lived with you. That's right. I lived by myself. Right. Okay. But despite that, you made it your business to exclude Mr. Kasukas, although, as you tell this jury, it had nothing to do with you. Uh, Luke Kasukas had never done anything directly to me. Okay. So when you came back from Michigan, the first thing that you started thinking about was talking to Sean about doing something about Luke Kasukas to shut him down. Yes. A lot of people thought that Mr. Kasukas was a very profitable drug dealer. Yes. Okay. And a lot of people, one of the ways that you've told the police he would rip people off is because people had the confidence to invest in him. Yes. Right? And people had the confidence to order drugs through him. Yes. Okay. And so when you came back with your expanding business, you and Sean began talking about getting rid of Mr. Kasukas. Yes. Okay. And when we talk about getting rid of Mr. Kasukas, you're talking about murdering him. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. It wasn't about sending him a message. It wasn't about going out and, you know, threatening his friends. It wasn't about just trying to woo away his business. It was about killing him. No, it was more about finding him. Well, and killing him. Not necessarily. What we really wanted was to confront him about the money he owed and the people he had robbed. Okay, sir. Did you use those words when you talked to the police? that your intention was to kill him or murder him? I don't believe I ever said I would kill him or murder him. statement on February the 8th. Okay. 
page 67, sir, and if you can just read that to yourself starting at line 13 and going over to the next page to line 4. He says, sir, I understand today that you've told us that your original statements that you gave on the night of February 5th and early morning of February 6th, you have sort of distanced yourself from them saying that you were under the influence of the medications that the hospital gave you. Yes. Okay. And so you weren't very clear at that time. Yes. Right? But you did, however, sir, tell me in deposition on May the 20th, that the statements that came after that when you were no longer under the influence were reliable. Yes. Okay, so on February 8th of 2017, as you told the state, you went to the police department and you had made up your mind that you were going to be honest with them and truthful with them and tell them what happened. Yes. Okay, and when you went down there and talked to them, you told them that Sean had asked Chris if he could murder or have Luke murdered and wanted Chris to give him the okay. That's correct. Okay. And you went on in that statement to say, Sean's word holds weight in this town to where, you know, if he says he's gonna do something or he wants something done, it happens. So I believe Chris was afraid because he knew that I had all of the equipment to do anything like that. Like he knew I had smoke bombs and tear gas, you know, all kinds of stuff that I could have supplied to Sean, right? Right. Okay, I mean, that's what you said to them under oath on February 8th 2017, Detective Sanders and Detective Hirsch. That's correct. Okay, you didn't tell them, hey, we might have said some things, we didn't mean it, it was a joke, we were playing a prank, nothing like that. No. Okay, your plan was to take care of Luke Kasukas by murdering him. When you say my plan, you mean me specifically? Well, you were gonna provide all the ammunition needed Yes, but right. I never said that I was going to murder Luke. Well, you did say you thought it was a good idea. I didn't disagree with it. That's correct. Right? The world would be a better place without him. Isn't that what you told the detectives? Yes. Okay. So you were perfectly happy with assisting Sean Henry in getting that done. Yes. Okay. And as after you had made that decision of that was how you were going to proceed, as you told the state in direct examination, you didn't keep it a secret. Jupiter's a pretty small town, right? Yes. Okay. And after you had made that decision, you started calling people. You called Massimo, right? Yes. You called Ray Perez. Yes. Right? You called... People, what your plan was and that you were trying to locate Luke Kasukas. I don't believe I told anybody that I was planning to kill someone. But I did call those people and ask for information about Luke. Because you're going to take care of the problem. Yes. Okay. And so in doing that, you're letting everybody know that you are actively looking for where Luke lives, when he's going to make deals, when he's going to have money, when he's going to be at the gym. Right? Yes. Okay. It wasn't, it wouldn't surprise you to know that a lot of people knew about that in Jupiter, would it? No. Okay. And then despite the fact that you knew that Mr. Vasada was a friend of Luke Kasukas, you and Sean decided to contact him and essentially ask for his blessing to murder Luke Kasukas. I believe that uh, Chris was pretending to be Luke's friend at the time. I thought I was under the impression 
that Luke had owed Chris money because I went over to the 6th Street house that Chris operated out of, and I saw Luke's bike there, and Chris offered to sell it to me. When was that, sir? Um, I believe this was before I went to Michigan. So months and months before? Yes. Okay. Um, and so you thought that even though Luke and Mr. Vasada were together and talked to each other and communicated with each other and did business together, that Mr. Vasada, he was just lying about how he felt about Luke Asukas. Yes. Okay. When you came back from Michigan, um, almost immediately you made a purchase from Mr. Basada, right? Yes. And you owed him money. Yes. Okay. And you owed him money at a time when Mr. Vasada was actually in Colorado snowboarding. Yes. Okay. And so when you contacted Mr. Vasada um, in late January of 2017, he told you to meet up with Luke Asukas and pay the money that you owed. Yes. And you did that. Yes. And it was several thousand dollars. It was two thousand dollars. Okay, and this was a week before this incident. Yes. Okay, so clearly at that time, Mr. Vasada and Lucas Sukas are friends, and Mr. Vasada trusts him enough to ask him to pick up thousands of dollars from you. I was under the impression that Luke was working for Chris to work off a debt that he owed him. Running that impression time. isn't based on facts, sir. Though, right? It's no. just based on thoughts running through your mind. Yes. Okay. And so based on some speculation that has no basis in facts, you decide that Mr. Vasada, maybe he's not really friends with Mr. Kasukas. Yes. Okay. And so you are looking for Mr. Kasukas and you have the firepower to do this. That weekend, or that week before this happens, Sean is at your house pretty much all of the time, correct? Yes. Okay, in fact, um, Sean had been away for a little while and came back in. He was away when you first came home? Yes. Okay, and had returned at the end of January? Yes. Okay, and when Sean came home, you decided to speak with Mr. Rosada specifically about whether or not it would be okay to murder Luke Kasukas. Yes, I had told Sean to talk to Chris about it to see uh, if it was going to adversely affect anything Chris was doing or if he didn't want Luke gone. So you have talked about your contacts with Mr. Rosada after you came back. And Mr. Rosada was an individual who regularly changed his phone number. Yes. Right? Um, and regularly got a new phone, disposed of his phone, got a new phone. Yes. All right? And so, in fact, when you have his number in your phone, you're always changing it to write Chris Vasada New, Chris Vasada Newest. Yes. Right? And so you start communicating with him. You've told us that you saw him on Saturday, right? Yes. Okay, and in addition to the fact that Mr. Basada changes his phone regularly, he's also an individual who doesn't text. If he does text, it's very short. Okay. I mean, you guys would text each other like, yo, yo, uh, right? Hey, can I come by? Are you home? Hit me up, right? Yes. Okay, other than that, you would be calling each other in order to communicate. Yes. Right? And so, February 5th is Sunday, right? 
Yes. February 4th is that Saturday. Yes. Right? February 3rd would be Friday, right? Yes. Okay. And so on February 4th, the day that you're telling me that Mr. Versada came to your home, tell me how that was set up. He texted me uh, sometime in the evening and asked if he could come by, and I said yes. And he came over and uh, checked out a few of the firearms I had. Um, he said he wanted uh, an assault rifle. I showed him two of the assault rifles that I had. And so that was on the 4th, right? Yes. Okay. And so you're telling me that your first communication with him was by text message on the 4th? I don't know if it was the first communication of that day. Okay, well, I'm just going to show you, sir, all of your text messages for February 4th. Pause there while you're looking. I get jurors need a break. Okay. Um, so you can get yourself lined up there. Uh, take the jurors back into the jury room. Take 10 minutes and uh, get some coffee, whatever you need, and they get the situation lined up here. <coughs> Don't talk about the case any way, shape, or form. 